Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning. I'm here by myself this morning. It's snowing yet again, so uh, I didn't want anybody to have to drive in the snow to come over and do the devotion with me. And Stacy uh, didn't have any delay at going into the office, so um, just you just have me this morning. So we're in First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five, and. Uh, I pray that this uh, week is starting out well for you. I uh, pray that God's hand of peace and guidance be with you throughout the week. Um, we need the Lord each and every day in our lives. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. We need his guidance. And a great way to start each day is to be in God's word. Uh, so spend some time just reading his word, reflecting on his word, uh, meditating on his word, pray, time of prayer is to kind of get our lives uh, centered and um, understanding of what is important. Uh, many people are living their lives with themselves at the center and other things revolving around them. And that's a, just a recipe for a life where you're, you're kind of going up and down and up and down and uh, being pulled in many different directions. But for life is centered and anchored on, on Jesus, uh, the author and perfecter of faith. Uh, we have much more of a stability in life. We know we're held in His everlasting and loving arms. So it's, I think it's very important for us to continue to, to dig into His Word and continue to uh, seek Him uh, each and every day. So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to read that for us. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first to, of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, and so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God, and continues night and day to pray, to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only did become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly, so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality, and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water, and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them, 
In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. Let us let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, as we reflect on these words that you have um, preserved for us and have come down to us at such a time as this, help us to see how to apply them to our lives, to our church, to our church family, uh, to live out the calling, the high calling that is ours in and through Jesus. So teach us now uh, and lead us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So in here, uh, he's laying out instructions for uh, you know how to deal with interactions in the church. Particularly, he's talking about uh, widows. Uh, but before he gets to that, I think there's a, a uh, he's laying out really how we should treat one another in the body of Christ. And so he says, um, verses 1 and 2, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. So, for a church leader that's younger than, than uh, some people in the church, he's given this instruction. How do you, uh, how do you teach them? How do you correct them? Uh, someone who's older than you. So you're, you're, you're kind of approaching that in a different way than somebody who's your peer, somebody who's younger than you. And um, then he says, treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So it's very important in the church, and I've been uh, really preaching on this lately, on, on how do we treat those who are single in, in the church? How do we treat those who aren't married, et cetera, et cetera? And... I, I don't think we do a very good job in the church of, you know, we talk about people being our brother or our sister in Christ, yet do we open our homes in such a way as a single person feels welcome into our home as, as we would our own brother or our own sister, or if we're older as a, as a son or a daughter, that we would welcome them into our homes and we would, would encourage them in the ministry that they have right now. Uh, as I mentioned a few weeks ago in a sermon, the average age of a man now, if he's going to be married in our culture, that's if he gets married, the average age of marriage is 30. So that's about, that's a good third of their life as, as a single person. So why we kind of act as if well, we're waiting for somebody to get married and then they can do something in the church or whatever it is, we need to equip the saints for the work of the ministry right here, right now. And there's many gifts that single people have that we could be using in the church and uh, equipping them and encouraging them as they seek to follow the Lord. Um, so then he, then he talks about how do you care for somebody who's a widow? Uh, obviously, there's many widows in this culture. A lot of times the, the men were sometimes substantially older than the female when they got married, so there was a lot of uh, deaths of males and widows, many, many more widows in the culture. Uh, there's a lot of widows now, but this was much more common, and younger widows uh, as well. So how is this to be dealt with in the church? And he says, you know, if you are a believer, then you should be caring for your family, especially your immediate family, but to your extended family to an extent. Now, uh, and for those who truly have a need. Now, there are people that, that uh, you're almost enabling bad behavior, so you have to use discernment on this. And, but, but if there's truly needs, we should be taking care of it. Not the government, not the church. We should be taking care, uh, we, we should be taking care of our own families uh, and not relying on others to do so. So he's talking about widows who have needs. And if they really have a need and they don't have family to take care of them, the church needs to provide for them that, at, at that point. Um, but he also lays down some criteria, like if somebody is uh, 60 years and older, we put them on the widow's list. In other words, they don't have a means for caring for themselves. In that culture, uh, you need to be in a marriage relationship for provision and for economic provision and so forth. 
So the 60 years old and older, they're put on this list. If they're younger than that, he's saying, well, you know what, they're probably going to want to remarry, uh, get married again. And so uh, don't put them on the list. They're going to be seeking to do that uh, in any way. So don't put them in a position where they're going back on their word. In other words, they might say, oh, I'm 35 years old and a widow, and I intend to uh, devote myself to service the church for the rest of my life. And he's saying, wow, you know, that's great. That's all good. That's well-intentioned. But the reality is when the passions of the life and the world around you, uh, you're, you might be going down a different path and you might remarry. So don't make a promise you can't really keep. So that's what he's kind of saying in, in regards to these things. And that's why he says for younger widows, don't put them on, on this list. And he also says, you know, hey, if people aren't working, we're made to work. Work is a good thing. It's not, uh, it's not a terrible thing that you're working. Work is a good thing. Uh, yes, it's corrupted by our sinfulness. We, we make our living by the sweat of our brow and thorns and thistles and all those, those things. The computer hard drive crashes in the middle of your work. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on uh, that makes work difficult now. But it is a blessing. And we ought to thank God that we have the ability to work. And if we can work, that we should be working. Because if we're not working, our... our uh, tendency is to fill our lives with things that maybe not aren't, aren't the best. And in, in some cases, he's talking about people going around from house to house, and all they're really doing is gossiping. And gossiping is a big problem. Gossiping is listed in uh, list right along with murder and other things. He's saying, you know, the Lord doesn't like this. And, and, and yet, uh, you look at the checkout, checkout line in the grocery store, and you've got the tabloids there. There's all kinds of gossip on what the latest celebrities are doing and so forth. So we're permeated with gossip, and we can do that in our own communities as well. Uh, talking hearsay about, did you hear about what this person did? Did you hear about what that person did? And that doesn't build anybody up. That's not encouraging to anyone. So he's saying, hey, let's keep our occupied with fruitful labor and not use the time you have in gossip and other things. Um, so, uh, he's also, then he moves on to talking about the elders in verse 17, um, and how they're worthy of being supported so that they can continue to do the work. That is their, that is their work. Now, there are times when the Apostle Paul was a worker priest. He would uh, make a living off of tent making, um, but uh, that wasn't his desire all the time. He wanted to be able to do full-time ministry. And so he was thankful for the support of the churches around him to continue to do that work. So he's saying, yeah, if someone's a pastor, to try to support them is so that they can engage in that in a full-time effort. Um, and he also says if an elder falls and there's, established by two or three witnesses, but don't bring a, you know, if, if somebody's just bringing some false charge against an elder, he says, you know, kind of ignore that. But if there's two or three witnesses, uh, he's saying, hey, they need to be disciplined, and they need to be disciplined publicly, because there's public trust that's been violated. Uh, that's in verse 20. Um, and he says, this is so important, Keep these instructions, verse 21, without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. How easy it is for us to have favorites. How easy it is for us to turn a blind eye to people that uh, we naturally like or we have an affinity for. And he's saying, no, we need to have an equal and just way of doing things that we don't show favoritism. We keep these instructions across the board. Um, and then he it says a little personal uh, aside. Um, he says if, to Timothy, uh, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. you got to remember in, in uh, these ancient cultures, uh, ancient places, including many places in the world today, clean drinking water is a issue. It's a problem. 
Uh, I was over years ago in a mission trip to Zambia, and I was horrified to see what some people were drinking, children were drinking, grotesque water. Uh, and so, you know, clean drinking water is an issue even today in many parts of the world. Um, and what he's saying is, you know, in, those, in that environment, if you uh, have, a, if there's a little alcohol in it, maybe not a high dose alcohol, but it's enough to kill some of this bacteria and other stuff that is in there, uh, that hey, maybe you should be drinking a little wine for your stomach. He's, he's saying that to Timothy, um, and then he says uh, to that, that that hey, everything that we do in this life is going to be found out sooner or later. At least the Lord will know. We might be able to hide things from other people. But the sins, he says, verse 24, the sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. So everybody knew about that, right? We, we, it was kind of obvious. It was public in nature. The sins of others trail behind them. In other words, they thought they had it hidden, but it's not hidden from the Lord. Those sins are all going to be revealed. But also in the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. So as you live your life out for Christ, that you're making an impact on people's lives, and it might not be a showy impact, it might not be some thing where everybody recognizes what's going on, but you're, you're uh, bearing fruit in what you do. As, as Jesus said, uh, that when the seed is planted and, the, and, the, and uh, bears fruit, some 30, 60, 100 fold, uh, and uh, out of this, the little seed that, that you grasp onto the faith in Jesus Christ, and he does great things through you. And it, again, it might not be flashy, might not be like the world, like, wow, look at, look at all of that. But you're making an impact on people's lives for eternity. So I encourage you in that to continue on, to follow Christ. Do not grow weary of doing good. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your presence in our life. Thank you for the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Empower us by your spirit to go forth this day, to follow you, to engage in doing good uh, for all people, Lord God. Help us not to grow weary uh, and to be uh, overwhelmed by the negativity of the world, but instead, Lord God, to be a positive influence in the world around us for the sake of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day. Oh, the plow's coming down the street right now. <laughs>